to get started, we're very honored uh, to have uh, two very different, uh, distinct gentlemen with very different, distinct uh, uh, corporate cultures. And one is a uh, very established, uh, uh, sorry, the name, Philip Wangs from Wells Fargo, uh, senior VP of uh, Integrated Brand and Marketing Manager. Uh, Mio Sakat is uh, C uh, the president and COO of uh, Calbee. Uh, anyone uh, heard of uh, Wells Fargo? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. Okay. Anyone uh, heard of uh, Calbee? Yeah. Oh, I'm surprised. Okay. Are you sure? <laughs> That's right. Okay. Well, I didn't really know. I love this name, but I didn't know Calbee equal to that. So I'm being honest. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I'm learning as we go. Uh, and we're very honored because they are a very distinct, different company. And, uh, uh, we hope to uh, have a dialogue and talk, talk about, you know, fundamentally, you know, how it, from the front, very differently on both sides of the world, uh, international uh, company versus the, uh, the U.S. establishments, you know, with a long history. When we talk about, you know, cultures, uh, diversity, uh, the, the differences between them, and, uh, and what's going to impact of their go-to market. So that's a two part of our conversation cultural diversity, cultural competence, and then go to market. <laughs> so before I started, uh, I, a few years ago, I went to NYU, uh, and I, I won't say how many years ago, so age and age, you cannot tell. Uh, <laughs> and I, I always hang out with the uh, film school, T school, uh, because they were always cooler, you know. Uh, so I t attend some classes, and uh, one thing I learned for the rest of my life is Whatever you do, always tell a good story. And the comparing story, you need drama. Okay. So today, <laughs> I'm going to put the panel, you know, uh, expose them. I ask them to share, uh, not only introduce themselves, but I also tell a bit about their story. So started from myself. Okay. So um, when I first came to this country uh, and, uh, at NYU, and I was one holiday, Christmas uh, Eve, after dinner, and I'm riding subway at uh, 3 a.m. in the morning from Queens back to Manhattan. Um, uh, and it was cars empty, and there's uh, two uh, teenagers, uh, African-American kids, come out of the car, and just two of them, and me. And they sit getting closer and closer to me. They call, yo, Lynn. Oh, no, Lee. He called me Lee. And, and then she started to, you know, it's like, ask me to talk about a certain thing. I was new to the country, and I was scared. They are taller, much taller than me. And so I was started to prepare, and it was rainy night, and as they sit, they both sit next to me, and I'm in the middle, middle. and I stand up, and it was rainy night, so I have an umbrella. So what I did, I do this, <laughs> come with my umbrella <laughs> hand, really? and I try to strike them, and then bang, and hit on the bar in the subway car, and it was a splash. And this took a sec. Bravo, wow, great, how do you do that? Teach me. Right, and so the right, this is back in the early 90s. The right, we talk and we do those things, the Kung Fu thing, and uh, we remain in contact actually for quite some time, you know, Darian and Sean, and they, in return, they teach me some breakdance. So I can bust some moves, you know. not today, but I do, I have some moves. Um, that was then. That was then. Uh, time have changed, and so, Phil, you want to share some story? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I'm Philip Wang. I'm, I'm with Wells Fargo. Uh, I run the essentially the brand marketing efforts for for the bank. A um, little personal background. Uh, certainly been on an interesting journey personally. I, I am a first generation uh, Asian American. My parents were immigrants from China. Uh, and they came in the country in 1948, just before the communists uh, created uh, communist China, with the intention, eventually, of returning back to China. But of course, at the time, you know, they didn't know any better, and then eventually realized they couldn't go back. Um, and then my father built a nice career and eventually joined the U.S. government and was, became a U.S. diplomat. And as a result, we traveled around, around the world and you know, many different countries, Asia and, and Europe, 
Um, and they had a great life and, and very, very full life. And, and the one personal story I know Jeff wants me to share is last year was not great. Um, just a little reveal. Both my parents passed away last year um, within 90 days of each other. And I look at that as a blessing because I think they knew this was the time. They had a good life. They had a full life. And we were there with them. Um, but it's, uh, it's a journey that we're all on. And so I'm very reflective these days about life <laughs> because I, of that. I, I, it's, it's, I still have my hair stand up. On. I was very touching about a story. Uh, if, you're Asians, if you're Asians, you know that that's part of our heritage. The parents' relationships, where they're coming from in that generation. But I find it's very relevant today. It's about commitment, long-term commitment. Right in the relationships and the go-to time and how to you to make that work, right? And how you pass on to the generations. And, and, and that you cannot teach, you live through it. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, okay. I know this is very, very personal. Okay, um, my name is Mio Sakada from Kami North America. Um, the, today's first session, I, I realized that everything I talk on Philip Top is totally opposite. <laughs> So that's all about this, this even the closest opposite color. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the fun part. But um, I'm from the uh, food manufacturing company. Food, food industry always started with eating, and we finished eating. But are you guys still hungry? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I do that. <laughs> so if you want, pass, oh, pass this, if you want. If you are, I don't force you guys to eat this, but uh, you know, um, it's always great to feel and touch and eat and munch and uh, not. <laughs> if you we want, share. Right. Share. oh, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, cool. Thank you. thank you. So, and and I. <laughs> thank you. I received feedback from the first session from multiple people and mm -hmm. said, how old are you? <laughs> I'm 38, so I just want to explicitly say that because people think I'm uh, early 20, so why I'm sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I'm born and raised in Tokyo for 20 years, uh, 27 years, sorry, 27 years. Uh, graduated from University of Tokyo and joined McKinsey and Company as a management consultant for five years. Then moved to Stanford uh, Graduate School Business for two years. Then uh, joined Disney, Disney headquarters in um, LA for the first job in the US. Then somehow I joined this Discovery, crazy <laughs> snack manufacturing company. And that's a boring side of my story. But um, I think that for a standard kind of, I don't like the generation, but still. Uh, standard Asian or Japanese family or ma mom, this is kind of success ladder, successful ladder, and somehow this ladder collapsed at the same time when I joined Kaobi, this company. Turns out my mom figured out I'm gay, <laughs> mm -hmm. and she, dra she literally dramatically fell off, fell down when, I, when he, she realized that at the bathroom of her parents. <laughs> I didn't say anything, she just collapsed. But, but that's the time I realized, okay, now is the time I can be free. I'm still struggling to deal with my mom. I, I love her, but um, she's still in denial. But I think that for my career-wise, I somehow um, removed my career path at the moment. So I decided, okay, I really want to do what I want to do. And that's the time when I joined Calvi as a director of marketing. And the first thing I did is re uh, branding all these Harvest Snaps. This probably, you don't know Calvi, but you know this product. It's a, it's a green pea snack, better for you. You can find it everywhere in this uh, country. And I started this from scratch and launched it. And it's a really fun time. And uh, that's the starting of my career in Calvi. And I le um, stayed there for five years, left a little bit and came back as a new position and CEO right. president. So that's my story. Well, so the quote and quote from this morning, uh, Bo Young's uh, sessions, minority, check. LGBT, check. <laughs> I think you're done for this session. She can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm leaving. <laughs> you qualify. Um, but that's, a, that's an extraordinary strength and courage, of course, you know, especially I understand from the Asians, the culture and, and operating. Uh, thanks for sharing too. So um, 
Now we are on, on today's subject, uh, cultural competence. Uh, I think that uh, to uh, we talk about this, this subject is pretty complex and challenging, and I think that Bo Yang covered a lot this morning. Uh, it's, it's not, I think the definitions are right and wrong, and then uh, 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 the, uh, and the past and now uh, is, is changing. And especially this day with a lot of social movement, uh, you, you create a lot of new dialogue, but at the same time, you also create a lot of new frictions and, 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 uh, and, and uh, evolutions as, as well. And we are still learning, and a lot of people are still learning. And, and I think that uh, it's not just dialogue between the minority, but also how we're going to cross over. Uh, and there will be resistance, and there will be destructions, but hopefully that's how we're going to move forward. Right? Um, so um, this is a very complex subject, and uh, I personally think that um, I want to brought up the, um, uh, for example, even the, I think when you look at the late night move, uh, the TV, for example, you look at the Friends rerun, and it was so funny back then, and now you feel like so wrong. You know, the gender, especially the race, there's so many stereotypical, you know, the uh, Chandler got locked in the chain in the chair by his boss, the female boss, you know. Everything's, the society is changing, right? So, um, by definitions about the cultural competence, I just want to put that up that um, I want to read it in a way so and I make sure that it's captured academically correct. Um, to respect cultures that are different from our own and, and the constant self-education in learning how to act and react appropriately to people whose experience and reality may be different from our own. Got it? Okay. I don't think it's, I, I, in my mind when I read this, and I right away I think about the one person really done it all, and this was the best way to talk about this subject. That's uh, Anthony Bourdain. Uh, God raised his soul. Um, he, he was never trained. He was never trained. Uh, in cultural competent class, he was never trained as a journalist, but lived his life exactly. So in his program, that's according to his statement, to visit a part of the world that he was unfamiliar with, meet people he would never normally meet, and try to gain an understanding of who they are from the relationships with food. And he's not judging from one's culture or perspective, I try to understand what others do and respect the culture by walking a mile in their shoes. In his case, break bread and share a beer on the table. That's definitions of what we want people to think like that. Not our standard, not, a, a, not one, one-sided, but there's a spectrum of the differences. When we started to be able to understand the other Chances are we help us to be able to move forward. And today's session is actually, uh, it can be more perfect because on the surface, whereas Fargo and Calvi can be, cannot be more different. You know, as I mentioned, uh, 140 institutions with a long legacy and challenge and mature uh, and, 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 and grounded reputations. Uh, Calvi on the other hand, Although, in fact, they actually established 1970 in the U.S., but they are indeed coming to the pictures uh, very recently. So they are like a startup. And it's the one of the emerging com international company that's from e Asia, from other countries that become, want to become a uh, U.S. brand. Um, very different backgrounds and very interesting. And the first questions we'd like to discuss is like, you know, how from who you are, the corporations, and then especially two Asians, male in a minority in a C-suite in the corporate world, you in charge with the brand and your operations in other directions. How do you see that your company's the current uh, cultural competence and diversity program that actually work, and how you feel that you have helped or changed that? Uh, maybe started from. Yeah. Sure. Um, so w Wells Fargo is a pretty big company. Um, we are, um, you know, one of the, the big four. Uh, we have uh, 269, 270,000 team members. Mm -hmm. um, we have relationships with one in three Americans. So um, we have a mm -hmm. core 
dedication to diversity inclusion because we have to. And it's because of the nature of the businesses that we're in. We serve so many different communities, so many different segments. Um, we need to have people from our various communities talking to our clients and customers from mm -hmm. those communities. And we need to be able to do it at scale. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really important. We look at diversity and inclusion across sort of three lenses, both in terms of our team members, but also in terms of the customers and clients that we attract, both in terms of consumer and uh, you know, mostly consumer, but you know, think about it in terms of small business or wealth investment management or even wholesale, um, which is our B2B side of the house. And then um, we also think about it in terms of the community organizations that we represent, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of the communities that we support, and these are organizations that are trying to drive greater diversity and inclusion. So we really think about it holistically, mm -hmm. um, and we have a lot of different programs and efforts to make sure that we hire in our pipeline as much diverse talent across all the diverse segments from you know, LGBT to Asian to Hispanic, African American, people with disabilities, veterans, um, we do it on the business mm -hmm. side, and we make commitments to have like African-American home ownership. I think it's like a $260 billion commitment over the next 20 plus years or something, mm -hmm. you know, something huge. Um, all because we know that that's important for us as a successful company if we can actually reflect and participate and serve the diverse communities that we are in. So Correct. it's a big part of it. Yes, uh, it's quite challenging, especially the operation that you have, the scale. Yep. Right? Yep. So quite opposite in Kobe, North America. So Kobe as a whole and globally, we are $2 billion sales. We are actually the second biggest snack company in the world next to Frito-Lay. Nobody knows it. <laughs> but this US, it's wow. just a 400 people uh, with the three factories. And we, to be honest, we don't talk about diversity. And uh, when I join, rejoined this company a year ago at the town hall meeting, you know, I want to talk about my direction and setting. And I, I include some word diversity. And I remember what, once I said diversity, the people's like, uh, atmosphere shaked. What the hell is this person is talking <laughs> about? We don't want to talk about it. Or we are not ready to talk about it. So that's the kind of the situation here as a, as a, as a small, mid-sized company. But uh, on the same time, it's very interesting. This company is diversity is not natural naturally happening. Like for example, in the three factories, one in Mississippi is predominantly African American, and one in Oregon that is predominantly Hispanic. <coughs> and in one in California, it's predominantly Asian, and headquarters in the uh, same location in California is all over everyone, every, everyone from different ages, genders, sexual orientation, blah, 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 everything. So we are working together, 400 people, and we don't have any, uh, we have tons of issues to be honest, but we don't, we are working together as the nature of the business and that's how it works. And I feel like, you know, listening to Philip's uh, talks and uh, also, you know, in Kobe headquarters in Tokyo, they have a huge diversity committee. And uh, it's interesting that they are only, currently they're talking mainly or 100% talking about women's empowerment. That is the only the diversity they're mm -hmm. keen on at this moment because in Japan, right. we don't have too much of the race, race issue, right. the reli religion issue. They're focusing on that stuff. So we got to figure out in the US right. operation, we got to figure out the new format of diversity program. But at this moment, we, we are, this is the status. But is, is there, I mean, it's a, such a, a, a young, but also, uh, and, and by DNAs, you know, the, I still feel like it's, it's, it's the Japanese or the international company. Uh, and so uh, the diversity may be uh, a given. In, in yeah, sense. very different. And, and, uh, do you have any uh, measurement or you have any uh, the dialogue within, you know, internally that uh, could be derived from, you know, in art, you know, R&D or manufacturing label that... Uh, <coughs> Actually, we don't have any KPI or any goal on it. Right. Um, in Japan, um, because this is a women's initiative, their, their KPI is about uh, how many, uh, a percentage of women, uh, female executive. That's the goal they have. Right. They want to do half and half. It's right. clear from the chairman of Akira Matsumoto right. clearly said that this is intentionally do it. And they are working toward that. In US, it's, it's actually more like naturally happening. And uh, basically, I, you know, my, my 
you know, my character and my background is all about, you know, the diversity, to be honest. I, I maybe lost my identity, where am I from, and uh, who am I am. I'm, I'm a kind of youngest executive in the company. Everybody in a VP level is about 50 years old, and they have to deal with this kid-like guy. <laughs> and uh, this kid suddenly say he's gay. <laughs> How does he, that they have to handle it? But that's, that's the culture that I'm creating intentionally. And we, I carefully pick up the people from very different type of uh, personality and character and background, right. and that form form this company is more diverse focus naturally. So I don't have any program at all, mm -hmm. but people understand where I want I want to go. And, and Phil, uh, from your personal background, who grew up and live in all the different part of the country, uh, different country of the world, and uh, and, 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 and truly. You know, diverse, multicultural, who you are, and uh, working in a company uh, that definitely, and especially in the financial industry, institutions, uh, even more complex. Uh, you, you, how you, as a, as executive, versus as a person, as a consumer, how do you see that uh, uh, work within your corporations? Any, 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 any rule you feel that something still in the room to improve, or is there something that you? You think that uh, Wells Fargo have go uh, and beyond because, as you as many of you may not know, Wells Fargo is number seventeen of the diversity in uh, last year and has been on the top ten for years. Yeah. And so you have a successful story. We, we do. We do. I, I think Wells is uh, at the core. We have a, a. It's built into our value system as a company. Mm -hmm. um, I think our leaders do their best to try to live and breathe it every day, mm -hmm. I think we can always do better. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, right. that's just a, a given. I, I think if you look at senior leadership within most U.S. corporations, it's right. not as diverse as anybody wants. Mm -hmm. um, we do have, I think, across the enterprise, um, I think 42% of our team members are you know, of ethnic or diverse backgrounds. That, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, it, it varies by line of business. It varies by the, by the groups that you're in. Um, and I think a company as large as we are, ha we have to consciously mm -hmm. lean into diversity and inclusion. We can't just assume it'll happen naturally like a Calbi because um, we are so big and we have so many team members and the cycling through of team members coming into the organization is a very, you have to be very deliberate. So our hiring um, policies are very clear. We have to include diverse candidates on the slate of recruitments. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean that they'll get hired. That's not the point. The point is you have to include them in the slate of, of, of people you're, you're interviewing for, especially for senior leaders. Right. And we're very conscious about it within like my team and the broader marketing organization around how do we encourage and grow the diverse talent um, mm -hmm. so that they are given opportunities, they are given the, the, the permission to mm -hmm. succeed and maybe fail, but that's okay. Right. Um, because I think that's a lot of what this is, and, and, and I think we, fortunately, I think we have a culture that, that mm -hmm. supports that. We just have to keep leaning into it because it's not something that comes just naturally Natural. to companies. Great. And also, uh, on, on, on the, the, the note that you two can be more different. You are brick and model, you have uh, front and you know, a tailor with the consumer daily. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, besides just the back end, you know, right. hundreds and thousands of employees. Uh, Kelby, you, you don't face, I mean, you are, you, you know, you product distribute to all different retail. You are, you are, you're virtually uh, have limited interactions with consumer. But in today's in reality, uh, your product is on everywhere, you know, and people can still go online and complain and talk about it, right? So let's talk about that's a cultural education preparations and, and, and communication to the audience. Uh, Mio, you want to start first? Uh, so what? How do, do you, uh, how do you interact uh, with the, uh, the consumer, uh, 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 the feedback, or even uh, complaints, or even you know, oh, a conversation about the product, or any ratios specifically common, uh, not American enough, for example, I don't want to go to the politics, but uh, things can happen, everything is online. Yeah, um, again, it's a small company, so we have 
like a very general like a feedback system, right? If you have go to the website, you can complain directly to us if you want. Social media is one thing, and the people are not hesitant when they can not they don't have to show their face. They can be nasty, really. <laughs> so it's daily, daily things happening. The product quality issues and. Uh, you are manipulating the ingredients or nutrition, <laughs> or it is not the real green pea. You know, those all is like a nasty things happening. What we believe in is that we just respond to response one by one, custom, uh, custom response to. Mm -hmm. So our customer relationship team is there, and uh, we are tracking everything in details. Okay. Yeah, so that's how that's how it works. And uh, if sometimes consumers complain is un unreasonable mm -hmm. but for, for for that person's perspective it's real mm -hmm. so their feeling is real even if it's not logical and it happens so what we always do is let them eat a product again so we send a box of product right. <laughs> no matter what right, right. and you know surprisingly when we send a box of product no matter how intense mm -hmm. the complaint is they're always happy right Send everybody a box at everyone. <laughs> if you complain to me. <laughs> I, I wish we had a box of product to send <laughs> to, yeah. to people. It would make my life a lot right. easier. Um, no, we, we're, we have so many relationships. Um, you know, we have over 70 million uh, customers that we serve. Um, our website, I think, uh, is, is upwards of 40 million interactions a month. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're dealing with money, your money. And uh, that's a high responsibility. So we are very sensitized. We have a lot of contacts with our customers, both one-to-one right. -one and then sometimes one-to-many. Um, and social media has, in the last couple of years, has not been a friend of ours. They, mm -hmm. they, they tend to heighten the negativity in there. Right. But I, I have not seen a lot of like, direct racial-related issues. It's, it's really around business. It's around yeah. service levels. It's yeah. around fees that they may not understand or feel right. that they shouldn't have been charged. It's not about a racially driven conversation. Right. Um, there's obviously, we do active outreach. So I'm in the marketing world. We do right. active outreach to our Hispanic audiences, African American audiences, Asian audiences in, in a deliberate marketing effort, digital as well as traditional marketing. Um, and, and that's very calculated on our part, very strategic on our part. We want to talk to them in, in, particular, in some cases in their language. Yeah. Um, so we, we are very um, conscious about right. serving and touching and, and trying to build relationships with our various communities. I know you also oversee on the, uh, not only diversity, but also on the crisis management. Uh, on the recent uh, Starbucks story, everybody talk about that, uh, and still fresh. And uh, well, they, they make a big efforts, they close uh, 8,000 store and they do these uh, racial bias training. Uh, of course, you can get mixed feedbacks. Some people are pros, some people think that that's just a show, just PR stunt, not enough. Um, what's your take, on? I, I think it was um, a great, bold step by Starbucks to do that. Um, I think they needed to, to do something publicly, so there's definitely a PR side to this. Mm -hmm. um, I personally don't think one to two hours worth of you know, racial bias training is really going to shape anybody and perhaps change anybody drastically. Um, I think it was really a message to the employees of Starbucks that this, this does matter. Right. Um, so it's probably more of a statement to them. Um, I hope the training made a difference. Right. But um, I, I, I'm with what Bo said this morning. I think you bring in your own personal biases, mm -hmm. unconscious or conscious, your, your stereotypes, your maybe your racism, whatever it is, into your business life. Mm -hmm. So um, a little training will help, right. but um, I can't believe that that right. is all they need to do. Right. Would you, pre uh, Kelpie, prepare, uh, I know you, you send in the box, free box, <laughs> prepare a <laughs> bigger crisis. Uh, wow, well, I don't, uh, it, it's a difficult question to be honest. And are we preparing uh, the quality side, yes, right. but the, uh, Racial or the, the you know the diversity related thing it's really we are not talking about that mm -hmm. for the consumers and and obviously as Wells Fargo the Philip says and most of the complaints come from come from quality right, right. because like if you look at this package you know um, nobody knows whether this is coming from Asian yeah. Japanese brand or you know where who who is this and then the back say that our 
our manufacturing is in Oregon. <laughs> so who knows? So, right. so you know, there's not that heated conversation. But yeah, okay. but that conversation resonated me. The first session I'm thinking about that it, it reminds me of the Chipotle things mm -hmm. as well that they Project, had a yep. quality issue and yep. they just, they close all the stores and do the right. like a safety training but right. after that E. coli again happened mm -hmm. right. and that lost the trust again from yes. them and they're still struggling mm -hmm. so again as, as Philip said it's not about this this is PR effect for sure right. but how there's a corporate as a system mm -hmm. works after this right. training is more matters more right. than just doing that I think. I mean, I, I personally recently also attended a seminar, and then one of the professor he kept reinforced that you know the study that has been conducted years and years and years that there's never bad news. Any any anything your name your brand is on trending is good news, basically <laughs> because people talk about it and people forget about it, and then things you know evolve and change. Uh, uh, but there's a certain truth. Uh, the, the wisdom out of it is how to manage right so you won't prolong. You don't you know get it worse, right? A lot, to, a lot to learn from the big brother. <laughs> Not by age, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, um, oh, we just said, we just think about, uh, about listening to the public. Um, do you have any particular tool that you actually uh, uh, this set up that you have uh, and monitor uh, the consumers and the, their needs, uh, right. their want, and also perhaps Potentially, in, especially to the, the consumer changing, uh, the millennials uh, and, and, and Gen Z, their lifestyle are, are, are changing, the way how they're using the products are changing. And, and how do you? Yeah, we, we are um, heavily invested in research, market research. Um, we are actually, since our reputation crisis hit, hit about 20 months ago, we've been in the market researching daily mm -hmm. to measure um, our, our, how our reputation uh, is, is faring. Um, we do a lot of data analytics, um, like, like a big company, we have access to a lot of resources, a lot of data to try to understand what consumers are doing, what they're right. not doing, right. um, and driving to understand what are, their, what, are the, what are the things that we can do to help them mm -hmm. succeed financially. I mean, that's our ultimate goal, is to help our customers succeed financially. And, and w all of that comes from understanding who they are and where they're coming from. So we have everything from like social right. listening teams, looking right. at social media, to like, you know, one to one, we, we do all the types of research to better understand our customers right. um, mm -hmm. and, and figure out what makes them tick. Great. And as for Calbi, I think as we know, the world become more international, and the millennial are more open to cultural authenticity, and then also the uh, uh, the, uh, the foreign, the international, uh, the ingredient, the product, and the food, and you know everything. Uh, it, you see that as, as part of your advantage and, 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 and how you afford to reach out to the consumer, uh, or do you think that that's the challenge, uh, reaching out to the general uh, uh, the American audience, uh, especially when the political climate can detect uh, some, you know, why versus ethnic? Okay. Um, so we have two distinct different product groups. So one is this, green pea snack, better for you snack for everybody in the U.S. consumers. The other one is if you look at those like potato chips and shrimp chips, that if you're, you're born in Asia or grown up with an Asian family, you are familiar with. So if you look at this package, for example, or this package, you surprisingly so many, 90%, 95% of Asian consumers know this, even though we, I, hide this Calbee logo, you can tell this is Calbee. Mm -hmm. So that's how distinctly different. So I divided this product category in completely two different way. And uh, um, so like for example, this one, you cannot find Calbee name anywhere but actually here. <laughs> because it doesn't speak to the consumer. So the consumer doesn't care about who we are or mm -hmm. what the brand we are. It's kind of the very flat and totally against marketing branding uh, statement, but I can tell that, you know, for especially for food manufacturing, food, food industry, what people care about is the taste and texture. That's all. They, they want to just enjoy the good time to eating good food. 
And the next one could be the healthy or the good for you, or Instagrammable, whatever. And the third thing is a corporate brand. So we have to talk about why consumers have to eat our products because it's tasty, it's great. And that's the part of the Calvi DNA. So it's completely distinct, different on the branding. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the most important thing is that we, we, we win with what we believe in. I, we do consumer research a lot, a lot. But I, when I, whenever I talk to marketing team, don't rely on consumer research because that's not our strength. Mm -hmm. Our strengths, Calvi, we are proud of, of our DNA that we can make a damn good snack. <laughs> and why we can make a damn good snack? Because we know the technology, how to make amazing texture by controlling the moisture content of the ingredients. That's the source of our technology. That's the source of our strength. So let's make it happen for anything from potato chips to green pea to shrimp, whatever the ingredients we pick, mm -hmm. we extract the flavor out of the ingredients. Right. So our subtitle of the company is Kaobi Harvest the Power of Nature. And I think that that's a very Japanese, Japanese English, I guess. Right, right. But I think it really tells our strengths. Right. So that doesn't change what, no, no matter what kind of brand you bring, this one, that one, it doesn't matter. Right. We just make right. good food from the ingredients and right. that never changed as the strengths of Kaobi. It's not the strengths from Asian company, it's the strengths of our company, Kaobi. Mm -hmm. Great, right. and it's been long proved popular and success among Asian audience because it's so delicious. It's also very dangerous, like your iPhone. Once you start, it cannot stop. You cannot put it down. So, uh, I want to go back to the crisis management that you, uh, we yep. talked about earlier uh, with uh, with Phil. Uh, many of you probably still remember uh, some big news about Wells Fargo last year. Um, yep. Yep. So. Uh, it's, it's a huge challenge, and he's a big overturn. And uh, uh, you might share a bit about more. Yeah, about um, that. maybe you didn't hear about it, but we um, we got ourselves in a little bit of hot water about 20 months ago, um, yeah. and uh, came into a consent order with the OCC, one of our regulators, around um, un unauthorized account openings, and you know, very bad reputation hit. And as a member of the team trying to protect and strengthen the brand, that was probably the worst day that I've ever experienced in my career. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been on a journey of recovery since then. And um, I think hopefully some of you saw some of our recent marketing around. Maybe we should play that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, <laughs> let's play that commercial. We know the value of trust. We were built on it. Back when the country went west for gold, we were the ones who carried it back east. By steam, by horse, by iron horse. Over the years, we built on that trust. We always found the way. Until we lost it. But that isn't where the story ends. Right. It's where it starts again. With a complete recommitment to you. Yeah. Fixing what went wrong, making things right, and ending product sales goals for branch bankers. So we can focus on your satisfaction. We're holding ourselves accountable to find and fix issues proactively because earning back your trust is our greatest priority. It's a new day at Wells Fargo, but it's a lot like our first day. Wells Fargo, established 1852, re-established 2018. Mm -hmm. So, so that, th <laughs> thanks. That, that work broke um, about two months ago to, to help pivot the brand and to signal that we are making a change. What led to that is a bit, one basic data point, which was 70% of consumers had not heard a response from Wells Fargo, even though we believed that we were pushing out all the content, pushing out all of our responses, letting people know the many things that we've been doing to make changes. Um, but we realized that we had to do something else. So this was an effort to hit a very large swath of the population to tell them that we are pivoting, we are changing, we are a new company. We are reestablishing ourselves in 2018 because we know we have to, but the acknowledgement there was very deliberate, very bold, and uh, to be honest, very disconcerting to some of our senior leaders. Um, mm -hmm. I remember when we first got the concept what? reviewed, our head of compliance, senior leader in our company, hey, nice, this was Mike Laughlin, by the way, hey, nice, nice message, really like that, but you know, we can never say you lost it. Right. And, and 
we were like, we were like, well, we want to be bold. We want to do the right thing. And so we right. just quietly ignored that comment and just kept yes. moving. Right. Um, but I think uh, hopefully you get the sense that we are Seems trying here. to signal a change in the company. Right. I have never seen, I said this earlier, I have never seen the amount of change right. in a corporate environment the size of Wells Fargo that has happened so fast um, because of, uh, and, and we had to because of the crisis. Leadership changes from our president and CEO who, who got pushed out, new board of directors, leaders within the community bank that got changed, Reg regulatory uh, scrutiny that we've never seen that have required us to look at all the different policies and programs and way that we do business um, for the good, for the good. Because at the end of the day, we are making things better for our customers, but the crisis really triggered it. It was the catalyst. Right. So the, the, the cultural diversity and the inclusion is a play in the role of Absolutely. any of the process? Yeah, throughout this whole process, we were testing this across multiple segments right. to make sure that we could actually talk to everybody because one of the concerns was like, wow, this did, may not resonate with certain audiences. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, everything tested very consistently across our different right. segments. Right. Um, we actually produced this in Spanish, we produced this in Mandarin. Um, trying to at least reach as the widest grouping of audiences that we can. Um, mm -hmm. In general, the diverse segments were less critical of right. the company, right. um, and and we're, that's that's probably a good thing. There may be less awareness, um, but for the most part, this has been a challenging journey for the company. But hopefully, we, we've turned the corner. Well, trust is a is a very tangible thing, and 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 it's hard to measure. So, uh, if yeah. you have any. Uh, uh, particular uh, solid uh, 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 print about you know how to follow up or to measure how, yeah. how you're going yeah, to we, we, that. we've been measuring it um, right. pretty pretty actively since we launched and I, I can tell you at, at a high level people exposed to the campaign mm -hmm. have shown higher favorability to the brand higher consideration and higher purchase intent right so what we're doing is we're shifting that mindset and there's a lot of anecdotal feedback that we have as well that you know that just uh, you know gives us assurance or confidence that we're heading down the right path. A colleague of ours was in Boston about three weeks ago at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, mm -hmm. and he had multiple mayors from around the country coming up to him after and basically saying, "What you're doing now with this message is spot on. It's exactly what you need to do. It's brave of Wells Fargo. I'm so glad you guys are doing that." Because they want us to succeed. Mm -hmm. They want us as an institution, to, they don't want us to fail because we actually provide a huge service to a lot of the communities we serve. So in the long run, I think they want a comeback story. Americans love a comeback story. And, and they want us to succeed. Right. So that's, I mean, this, well, what time will tell, of course. And this is a long journey to, to re, the road to recovery. And, uh, but I, I think every step you take, I think this is very critical, right? Because uh, you're not 140 year, you'll continue to counting, right? Yep. You just started, restarted, yep. 2018. Yep. You are young, fresh, <laughs> and a little baby. Um, <laughs> and back to, uh, to Mio, uh, uh, Kelby, I understand that you don't have a brick and mortar, you don't face your consumer directly, uh, the, uh, it, 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 but the, you know, to continue to uh, uh, your success, uh, I know it's great to hear you know, uh, how big the distributions you are. Uh, by, the, by the way, if you don't know, any Walmart, you can find all their products. And so you know the number, the sizes of the distributions, uh, and all the bodega and, 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 and store. Uh, and also, too. And also yeah. too. Mm -hmm. yeah, see, it's everywhere, everywhere. And, but of course, the, all, the corporate is always you know, asking for more revenue and pensions, <laughs> right? So for how sure. do you keep that? Uh, and do you, uh, you don't have to tell the, the plan, but I think we'd like to know that uh, it's an, on your uh, uh, growth expansion plans, uh, uh, any of uh, in, in, in cultural diversity, would that be playing a certain role into your uh, growth, or you, uh, you will be added other different, besides this is Japanese, but there are other different you know, flavor from different ethnic, different country, uh, or is you were, you know, as something to, to make your company even more American, maybe <laughs> not the right word to say it, right? But you understand what I'm saying. Right? Yeah, the, the question includes a lot of stuff, but okay. I, I will divide in the uh, organization part and the marketing part. Okay. So organization part, yes, that you, our Japanese head, Japan headquarters look at our business by numbers, mostly. 
So when we grow fast and they have more and more and more, and then always a discussion is that what's the right uh, executive group or what's the right governance on it. And always, always uh, the fl flip-flop of centralization versus uh, localization. That's always an issue. Mm -hmm. And our history is that when um, this Harvest Snap started, when I joined this company as a marketing, mm -hmm. the whole, uh, whole direction is localization. So the Akira Matsumoto, the chairman of the Kawi, decided, okay, Kawi Global should be operated by local people only because we don't know the business. Then we rely on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the, that's the time. I, I happen to be director of market, Japanese director of marketing because I was a local hire. I happen to be Japanese. So right. um, that, that started on business grew. Right. But the flip side of that is that too much rely on the local they lost the site, mm -hmm. and they believe in the, disc, the business grow crazy, and they rely on that, and they, lo they, they forgot about investing in something else. Right. And then, then, then they, 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 they started to think about, hey, lo localization is not always a good thing, so let's go centralization, <laughs> and they tried to send so many Japanese people there, right. and that's also the loss. I think that the international company is always going back and forth, back and forth, and right. I'm in the middle of that, and I'm kind of a catalyst for both, because I'm right. kind of weird positioning lost in Trump, <laughs> right, right. lost of identity kind of person to juggling. But I'm more toward localization. So even though I'm a Japanese, I know a lot of Japanese executive in Kalbi, I really focus more toward hiring local people right. and uh, let uh, Japanese corporate understand what we right. need right. To, to make it happen. In terms of the marketing and the consumer side, um, my direction is like, you know, again, the research is not our strengths or nor operation so-so. But our strength is innovation technology and the new product development. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are pretty decent size, but not like Frito Lay. Mm -hmm. And we are not like a pop mom shop who, who don't have manufacturing facility. We have like a kind of farm to table kind of facility. And we have a vertical process from, we know the farmers, we have R&D, we have marketing sales, and in between we have manufacturing, supply chain, everything is in our company in a small scale. So we are fast, fast, fast. So we can develop a new product every six months. Mm -hmm. Usually people, it takes two years. Right. To, wow. okay. So the, the big company takes two years. We make it six months. So we use this fast generating, you know, new product development cycle. Right. And they, we, we will launch both the Asian focus and not, you know, right. all like a mass marketing. Thing. It's fresh. Yeah, fresh. It's fresh. But we always don't go premium. We always go mass. Right. As you said, you know, we are selling in Walmart and next door Whole Foods, they are saying the same thing. So yeah. we are selling total different market, but everybody likes everybody us liked it, yeah. because we are the snack company. Yeah. And also healthy snack too. Yeah. Although I won't say it's really, really healthy, but <laughs> if you eat, if, if you in eat my a sense, lot. <laughs> you say healthy, it's just big. <laughs> yeah. And um, the same thing I talked about, uh, we go back to talk about uh, uh, Wells Fargo too. Uh, I understand that uh, <laughs> you are very rooted in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been, and uh, you, uh, the, uh, especially your San Francisco root, uh, that definitely helped uh, your truly diverse as a company. Um, uh, have any changes? Uh, I think we talk about Asian Americans here. Uh, if any highlight, any uh, directions? We're, we're always trying to deepen our relationship, uh, especially in pockets where there's higher uh, density of, of certain segments. So Asian Americans, obviously, in San Francisco is a big push for us. That's a natural. And, and as we get a bigger footprint here in New York, for instance, that's also, that's also a big push. Right. Um, I, I think, in general, we are, we're always trying to be relevant at, the, at a segment level but also work at a more national brand level. So we're, we're, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a built-in tension to right. try to understand how to appeal to a mass right. play, but also be relevant to various segments. And you can think about it, with one in three relationships in the US, right. there are so many segments. And, and um, as a yeah. company, you can get into the trap of trying to over-segment mm -hmm. your population, and then you diffuse what limited resources you have to reach them. And right. that's, a, that's always that built-in tension. Right. So, um in your minds, 
personal opinion. Uh, I mean, Wells Fargo is, uh, definitely is one of the top uh, companies on, about diversity and success in, in, in everywhere. In your personal mind, uh, what do you think the best in class? Besides Wells Fargo, of yeah. course. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You asked me, I was thinking about that question. I didn't have a great answer. I think, um, right. I think some of the groups that are inherently, by, by the nature of their, their, their organization, Mm -hmm. cater to certain audiences and I, and I think of big companies like you know like Nike mm -hmm. where they've really been smart about how they segment but it's not just by diversity you know mm -hmm. they they segment it out by by the different types of athletes that you are and the passions that you have for that right. but I think they've done some pretty interesting pretty things from that yeah from right. a diversity perspective so it's me or twin for Kelby uh, what do you look after uh, as your role model I Per, my personal opinion, right? Yes. Yeah. I think yeah, everything personal. There's. Uh, <laughs> I I think Disney. Okay. So I used to work in Disney, and I feel the diversity there a lot in the company every day, okay. and uh, content they're providing is always a controver con controversial. Like for Asian, for example, like when they they launch Mulan. Right. Or they launch Big Hero Six. Always like, oh, this right. is a racial discrimination, blah blah blah. But think about the whole history of the last 30, 40 years. How how they developed, like a women's initiative converting Cinderella into Beauty and the Beast, and now Frozen. It's right. very like a right. top to the age thinking right. when they make a blockbuster, and that, and uh, they are always thinking about where where the new age of female goes mm -hmm. to, right. or. Like a, a, when they do the Princess and the Frog, the you know, first African American princess, it's again a controversial, but still, they're doing that ahead of other 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 people, other other company, and I think that kind of philosophy also all aligned with what I experienced in a company. There's so many different diverse people talking right. about and thinking about family entertainment in the Disney way. Um, that's the that's the role model I have. They inherit. They have a lot of system and process of diversity program, yeah. but they in inherit the nature of that inside. Well, like this morning said, uh, you have to if you want to train a person started from seven years old, right? Seven years old. That's how you get it. You know, to train them who they want, what they're gonna be, what's right and wrong. You know, but not Bo Yang's daughter. Okay, ten years old, know about the. <laughs> the whole history, <laughs> that's, that's unheard of, but uh, that's a different story.